keep consistent with every other garden tour that I've done this year. It's raining. It rained last night, raining later today. We just had a break in the rain, so I figured, let me go ahead and do this. Let me show you what we planted in our fall garden. So I did miss our August garden tour and our September garden tour. We were managing a lot of plants, getting a lot of plants out, putting a lot of new plants in, and it was just a lot. Not to mention the last little bit of all the summer garden stuff needed to be preserved in the kitchen. So I got a little overwhelmed, but we finally have a little lull in um, all the to-dos, and I will show you guys what we have going in the garden. Even at this point, it has grown so fast, it is huge. Let me show you. Okay, so you can see we have insect netting on where we live. I know you can hear my neighbor cutting down some trees, but we're gonna just continue and push on anyway. So our insect netting here, we still have quite a lot of moths and bugs out. They are really starting to be done by time the end of October comes and that's probably when I will feel confident enough to take off the netting. I have not had a spray BT yet but as you can see I have had some caterpillar damage but it's been able to be managed and removed by hand which is definitely my preferred method. Um, I took out some of this chard real bad but it's coming back. So I like to I prefer taking care of caterpillars and things like that by hand, um, not by spraying BT, but if you do have to spray BT, that is the one thing I do feel comfortable spraying because it only targets one um, pest and it does not affect anything else. It does not make a huge damage on the ecosystem like so many other things do. Okay, let's get down to the varieties and what we have growing. So you can see we've got dino kale that's going big and strong and now that it's getting cold it's really just I can taste like how much sweeter it's getting every single time we come out here and I've been you can't see on this one but on this one you can see I've been sniffing some of the little ones and eating them when I'm out here um, I always tell my kids to take from the bottom but the little ones are just so sweet and tender and then we have this is pak choy it's spelled with a P, not a B. So pak choy, you can use as a stir fry green or you can eat it raw like in a salad. And that's why I like growing this one in place of bok choy because bok choy pretty much needs to be cooked. You can see this is one we've already taken. That's one we've taken. This one will be ready soon. That's, these are weeds. This came as like, this was, we amended with, um, some local chicken and cow manure from farms that we are um, very very sure did not spray um, and it looks like they had a slow composting system not a hot composting system so they seemed whatever fodder I think it was probably when the like, chicken scratch grain maybe a wheat berry but you've had a lot of this pop up since we amended with that stuff which is okay these are the last of the summer garden these are the green beans. We're waiting on the last little bits of them. These ones still have some flowers. They're setting. These are bush beans. This is their second round, and then they'll be all done. Now these, this is cauliflower. Now I, of course, because my lovely little ones messed with my pots, and I didn't label each pot. I labeled each tray, and that was, I should have known better. Um, I have all my varieties mixed up, but I will tell you what varieties I did grow. So as far as cauliflower grows, we only grew two varieties and they were from Urban Farmer. It was uh, Snowball and Snow King. And one of them, they're both F1 hybrids, so I won't be able to save seed from them. But this was actually my first year growing cauliflower and I was a little nervous about it. Cauliflower could be tricky. Um, but I really wanted something that was going to self-blanch, which means the leaves will naturally come up over the cauliflower head so it doesn't get um, burnt or messed up or anything like that because the, when the sun beats out on the cauliflower flower, um, one, it opens so you get a smaller head because it will open and go to flower quicker than if you cover it. And two, it can get sunburned and it can make the color sometimes turn like a yellowy color which it's not really a big deal. Sunburn technically isn't a big deal. I'm not selling food, this is for our family. But 
I wanted one that's self blanched because I wanted to get big heads. So being nervous and doing that, um, I wanted to make sure I got those. So I did buy hybrid versions of them. And so far I have been extremely happy with them. All of these are all cauliflower back here. And then in the back we have broccoli and then I got a cabbage that I thought was dino kale. I'll show you why. <laughs> okay, so this is another dino kale and this is a cabbage. And when they were both little, you can see this is a Savoy cabbage. Um, they look very similar, but now that they've gotten bigger, it is clearly a cabbage. It'll just be like a wrinkly one, not a straight one, like a Copenhagen. So I just grew, this is my first year growing cabbage too. I've grown lots of kale, we've grown broccoli, but uh, cabbage and cauliflower, this is our first year. So this is uh, just a standard, I think it's called Savoy, Savoy cabbage, and they're already starting to head. Um, which is super, super cool. Um, and I'm trying to clean up, see under here, these leaves. So cabbage, look at that poor, poor spinach that was planted too early. But cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower will get yellow leaves like this. And this is not actually a deficiency in anything. This is just kind of how the plant grows. As they get bigger, they will just shed their bottom leaves. Um, the only thing is, is you really want to make sure you take them off because if not, something like a slug will come by and decompose them for you because that is their job. However, sometimes they get a little happy and they go a little too far up your plant and they start eating the plant in spots that you don't want them to eat it. But as long as you stay on the pruning like this, keep it off, kind of like a tomato. You just want to keep the leaves off the ground. And as the leaves get older, they bend down, turn yellow, and touch the ground. That is their growth habit. Which is, these ones are looking good. See the dino kale looks different. We've got more. So I sewed spinach in here, and you can see it got sunburned really, really bad. I sewed it way too early, planted it out way too early, and I was hoping under the canopy here it'd be okay. I think that's the only reason why it kind of got saved. And it'll, now that it's cool, it will come back. It will be fine. But it is really struggling right now. We have some more that I started that are going to go in the green stock over there. We have more pak choy. I kind of forgot that one was in there. You can see, look how bad the chard got eaten up by caterpillars. Are there any more on there? No. Caterpillar time is kind of done. But of course, now the caterpillar time is done. The stink bugs are back. Just stink bugs are, they don't really cause damage as in they eat your plants. But what they do is they have bacteria on the bottom of their feet that will just wither everything they walk on, especially something like, um, um, something like this was a little more with a waxier leaf it's not as bad from like a sunflower or your beans or your peas or something like that it's they're gonna really just do a number so this is broccoli this one i think if i'm not mistaken it's no it's not starting to flower yet it's just getting big this is fiesta this is also from urban farmer um fiesta is also an f1 hybrid but like i said I like I I don't mind hybrids. I do like saving my seed, but every once in a while hybrids have just been bred to grow really well and I have to say it is growing really well. So if you look here, the stem is really straight. And some of my other ones, the stems are more they fell and they kind of get that elbow and they come back up. And that's a very heirloomy way of growing. Purple sprouting broccoli is really really known for that. And something else we have in here is our onions. I interplanted onions all through here. Some of them, and unfortunately, so you can see these big thick ones are my onions. And then we had weed fabric on this over the summer, so they didn't get to germinate. These are wild onions. These are not mine, these little scraggly ones. But this, oops, this is my onion. Luckily, I can tell them apart, but nobody else in my family seems to be able to. They have come and tried to help me weed and they've pulled up a lot of my onions so this is a mom only job something else we have growing these big big leaves it's rutabaga oops look at that one that's awful rutabaga i prune the same way 
I make sure it stays off the ground. That rutabaga. This one in here is looking really good. Let's see if I can get a good shot of it. That one. She's looking lovely. Look at how big she's getting. If you've never had rutabaga, it's amazing. Rutabaga is like, it's a root veggie, but it's like really, really sweet. Um, it'll kind of remind you of a turnip, but without that spiciness to it. It's just sweet and delicious. I will say the ones at the stores though, if you buy them, they come waxed. So, you know, you have to peel it off and it just ends up being a hassle. And just, because it's not homegrown, it's just not, never as sweet, never as good. Especially when you have something that's been frost kissed. Uh, we haven't quite had our first frost yet. Um, everything in this garden is frost hardy, except for those beans down there. But when something like a fall brassica or a cabbage, or the rutabagas are actually considered brassicas, um, they are when they're kissed by the frost, the plant will actually concentrate its sugars and it is so much more delicious. <laughs> so we are waiting. October 31st is what Farmer's Almanac says for us. Um, but you talk to people around here and some old time people and they say like technically we get a frost but like we get our first hard frost in the November. That is a big difference. So we are going to see. So I just talked about our rutabagas and their giantness. And then here is, this is basil. So I leave as many herbs to flower as I can. Um, because the pollinators need, you can see I have my zinnias back here. Pollinators need stuff in fall just as much as they need stuff in winter. Because we don't want our pollinators, especially our bees, having to break into their stores before winter. Because that's really going to mess them up. And you got to think, by the time October comes, there are not a ton of flowers left. Even people who are planting like just ornamental things like in their front they're planting a lot of ornamental cabbages and things they're planting yes you have mums and things mums don't have a ton of pollen though um but they're planting things that just aren't super flowery and so they're really having to search for and forage much farther than they normally do so i always like to let my basil anything that i can go to seed this basil has been shading out shading sorry back over here this broccoli and this broccoli has been appreciating it what I do have to be careful of is see all of these have gone to seed inside these brown ones are basil seed and these will drop and they will become a weed problem for me but luckily the way this one was most of them will drop in the grass and we mow so it's not a super big deal some of them will drop around here but with the insectinating and stuff let me see if I can show you see all the dropped flowers We'll be able to collect most of it, and I wanted to help the pollinators out. And then here are fall tomatoes. So what's interesting, and you're going to notice this on a lot of my tomatoes, is blight. Where we live, I actually get blight much easier in fall than I do in summer. I really don't have a problem with it in spring and summer. I do definitely have a problem with it in fall because we have wet falls. Um, even if it just doesn't rain a whole lot, we have a high humidity and it just, it really, really adds to the blight factor. However, um, it does, I'd rather have it in fall because the tomato is not stressed by the heat also. So if you had blight and heat stress on them, you know, it's going to take them out. But some blight without the heat, you know, they're, they're still pumping out. They're still getting ready to... Um, set fruit they're still setting fruit it does take longer for them to ripen and to redden because we have less light uh, this is you know middle of October daylight savings is almost here it just is going to take them longer and what I will do um, these are determinate tomatoes so they I don't prune them as far as suckers but what I will do starting probably October 15th roughly is I come through and I pinch the tops off so that they don't keep growing up and they just focus on setting their fruit and ripening their fruit all the way down just because they don't have enough time to keep going. This is the one lettuce that made it from my first sowing. Um, I had started some and it just was too hot but this one because it was shaded by the um, tomatoes and it's next to this pak choy which gave it some shade in the beginning 
So that lettuce is doing great, but it's the only one I have. All the other ones of this variety are in the back and they're much smaller because they were planted about a month different. And then it's kind of hard to see in our shade, in our netting, but this is mostly rutabaga and cauliflower. I'm trying not to break my leaves. One thing about brassicas, the leaves break super easy. I need to, you see this? I need to, that's no good. I need to be able to get this netting off because I don't want my rutabagas getting stifled. Look at that one in there. That's going to be a big one. Oh, I'm excited about it. This is a cauliflower right here. Now, the cauliflower have a longer, longer day uh, than my rutabagas. Rutabagas are fairly quick. Um, so when the rutabagas come out, and that's what all this massive, you know, huge leaves are. So when the rutabagas come out, probably for Thanksgiving, that cauliflower will have more room to expand and get bigger. And I will say, weaving the insect netting in and out of these tomatoes has not been great for the growth of the stuff in the front. I definitely want to next year do just like one whole section, like one whole block of just the tomatoes be done and that will make my insect netting way easier to manage because this weaving in and out and putting the like that one trying to get these front ones in and then even still we had some moths get in there and that's why we had the damage up front because I didn't have it staked on the ground enough because it was weaving in and out of plants and that's just you know my fault but more fall tomatoes all oh, these are all romas we're 55 days they're setting fruit like crazy doing great this is a Thai basil like I said I let it flower for my pollinators and the rest of this is pretty much the same we do a lot of broccoli and cauliflower we do a lot of cabbages this is a Copenhagen cabbage it's like your typical smooth cabbage you can see it's starting to head and we have some blank space in here that we had other things that had come out when, when we had already planted all of these fall things. So that's why the spacing looks a little funny. And you'll see the spacing is tighter in the front and on the ends because actually this middle part was what was planted first. And I still had, I'm trying to think, what do we have there? Tomatoes, beans, something. We had something, oh, look, the radishes are up. So radishes are something that are my family's favorite. We actually hate them raw. We love them roasted though. It's like a totally different food if you roast them. Oh, this is a good thing to show you. So you see these leaves, how they turn like this purple color. So this purple color is kind of a sign of a deficiency, but you really don't have to worry about it if it's just the bottom leaves. If it gets to be the new leaves, that's when you're looking at an actual like deficiency in the, the usually nitrogen because cauliflower and block, broccoli, you want to give a ton of nitrogen, cabbage too, because the bigger your plant, the bigger that flower is going to be. So you want to get a massive plant to have a massive flower, and that's just kind of how that works. But earlier I was talking about the broccoli and it had it grew like straight up this is another fiesta broccoli see how it's growing straight up well here's an example of one that does it kind of I call it, it does the elbow thing see how it fell on its elbow and then came straight up that's just because they get really big and it's just doing that to help stabilize itself now it's not a tomato it won't get roots along its stem it's just doing that to hold itself up and that's actually a really good example along with all the weeds that are in here. But, um, the little elbow, let's see if he'll get the camera to focus better. So, that little elbow right there, and that just helps hold it up because they do get really top heavy, especially when they do start to get that big head flower. They, they just need to stabilize themselves. And that's kind of an heirloomy thing that ends that they end up doing is a lot that have been bred to just get a fatter bigger heavier stock that they don't have to do that in because you can see this is still kind of tippy a little bit so you know just depends on the variety you grow but just know it's not getting leggy it's not gonna be a problem it's it's okay <laughs> it's just kind of how they do it um, both are healthy plants 
you can see this cabbage is way behind because it got it was here in the front and you see it was woven in between these tomatoes and this netting wasn't completely on it and it got just skeletonized i can't believe it came back so quickly we amended so we amended all the garden with biochar we used but how we make biochar is um we will take a hard lump charcoal and we break it up just as small as we can the smaller the pieces the smaller it will decompose the more often you have to do it um, but you also can spread it out better. The larger the pieces, the longer it'll last. So we do pieces we like about that size, lasts about three years. And then we will break it up, we make compost tea, and then we will ferment and soak the biochar in the compost tea for three to five days. And then we will put it into the garden, rake, we just kind of rake it in. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to till it in, you just rake it along the top. And biochar is um, great as kind of like a slow release fertilizer it was soaked in the compost tea but really what you're looking for is that compost tea is filled with my microbes and fungi and all those wonderful things but it's a great microbial home because it is carbon it is porous um, so that is a great place for the microbes to have a place to stay when they're in your soil so it's just a, a good place kind of like you build a house and then it's gonna get filled with microbes kind of thing just kind of how that works but I really like biochar so far I've seen that we really like it it is kind of pain in the butt to make it takes about a week because we have to fill our container then we have to off gas it because our hose is city water it's chlorine water so if I don't get enough rainwater I do have to off gas it so we're waiting at least 24 to 48 hours for that then we make our compost tea which I brew ours for 24 hours especially for something that I'm going I want to be stronger and then we will soak it for another three to five days. So you can see it takes about a week to make it. Um, so you really kind of have to think ahead when you're doing that. It's not quite as easy as just, you know, putting like a liquid fertilizer on. And then we also amended with um, cow manure and chicken manure from a local farm that we are very, very sure is very careful about what they do with their animals. They are um, they do not spray, they do not do anything that would be harmful to my garden. We have had herbicide damage in the past and I'm just not willing to risk it. I will say though it is not beef cattle, it is dairy cattle. So when you're looking at manures, they're kind of rated and it's rated for like the gut biology of the animal. So like a worm's gut biology is like ideal. But like if you're looking at the gut biology of a sheep, you're going to have a higher NPK in the manure than that of a goat or dairy cattle. So it kind of goes sheep, uh, beef cattle, then sheep, beef cattle, I guess dairy cattle. And then you have like your cold manures that are llama, rabbit, and all of those. And those are kind of like a separate category. Then horses at the bottom. I feel like I'm missing one. But horse gut biology is kind of not awesome. The horses also get dewormed a lot, um, and so they have a lot of um, things. They, ha they, ha they, they don't have the microbes in their gut that's coming out in their manure that is ideal, but a lot of times you can get horse manure for free. So it kind of just depends on what you're doing. But um, like I said, beef cattle manure is always better, but it's a dairy farm, but I trust them, and that means more than anything. And they also have the chicken manure, which is extremely high in nitrogen. We combined them, so it kind of evens itself out. <laughs> you can see you've got more radishes coming up. We've had a lovely time of rain in the last couple days, so everything I sowed is coming up. And one thing they kind of tell you not to do is to prick out root vegetables, but I do it often. And especially if you're doing it right before it gets its true leaves. So you see these just came up. These still have their scion leaves. So my neighbor's doggy he hears me. They're, they're on alert because their family is not, not in right now. So you might hear him barking. But if you wait just until they have their scion leaves, they're up, you can for the most part prick out. I even done it with carrots. Prick them out, move them. That way you don't lose... Um, you don't have, lose any to bad spacing. Because even though if you plant them, 
um, in a good spacing, you know, rain and things move them and it just kind of happens. More fall tomatoes and all down through here, it's all broccoli and cauliflower and kind of the same things. Um, back in the back we have peas, but I'll walk back there to show you those. Now this section here with these massive broccolis, we had a water problem. We went to dig up our peppers and put them in pots. So these are our peppers. We put, dug them up out of the ground. We picked all the peppers and all the blossoms off of them, and we can see we have a full flush more. So these are our chili peppers, we have snack peppers, we have our one bell pepper, more snack peppers, and more snack peppers. So one thing I want to say, if you're going to dig something up and put it in a pot, if you're going to grow anything in a pot. The soil matters so much. So this is Coast of Maine Growers Mix. It's a little higher than our price point, but it is a really, really good quality product. It's something I am not going to have to amend. I am not going to have to worry about it. Um, so think about that. Maybe Coast of Maine isn't available where you are, but look for a high, high quality um, soil to put into your pots. And not a garden soil, not a, um, a an amendment, not a top soil. It needs to be a potting soil if you're going to put it in a pot and if you want any success with it. Um, the soil really matters the most when you're growing things and when you're putting something from you know your garden soil into your into a pot um, it's already acclimated to a different type of soil it's been growing in for you know months you really want a top-notch superb soil for it to have a good start so like I was saying we dug them up and we actually ended up having a bit of um, drainage problems and it just kind of comes from our land just kind of gently slopes right here and right here so it wasn't a compaction problem it was just the fact that the water kind of pooled and sat here which is never good to grow anything what that what happens with that is not only are things things cannot grow in stagnant water but things become anaerobic your microbial population becomes anaerobic and you have microbes that you don't want in your garden. Needless to say, I know Korean Natural Farming does some decomposition with um, an aerobic um, way of breaking things down. I don't know enough about that. I'm looking into it. It fascinates me. But I don't know enough about that right now to really have an opinion. But typically, aerobic, meaning things that can live and grow without oxygen, um, are not things that you want in your garden. <laughs> So here you can see we have more broccoli and these things just took off because what we did to get it up off of the soil was when we dug up the peppers, we had we dug them out and then there was just, I mean, it just filled with water, the hole. It was an absolute lake. So we took two piles of our, of our compost along with a bunch of sticks and bread. I'm going to walk us down to the very end because I always forget to show you guys the end. So before I forget, and we will walk back up the other side. I want to show you my Hot Wheels track. That's what we keep calling it because it grew very much like a Hot Wheels track. As you can see, this is our thornless blackberry. And I'm trying, I, I, I kind of neglected trellising it because I just didn't know what to do. Well, this is one, uh, one plant. You can see it's one crown and it has three shoots that came up. And that is all it is. And they are just literally that long on this side too I mean they are just it's our Hot Wheels track it's I don't know what else to do with it and yeah I know I planted berries under a birdhouse I, I'm aware of the irony of that so this isn't really garden but it kind of is garden stuff these are our bunnies um, bunny manure is cold manure meaning it does not have to be composted so you can take it and put it right on your garden also, rabbit manure will balance the pH of any soil, which is lovely, unless you have blueberries or any kind of berry, then you don't want that. But um, I, my mother-in-law has actually taken just like a bucket of rabbit manure and planted seeds in it and things grew. So rabbits are, rabbits are kind of like figs. <laughs> They'll grow no matter what. 
but we rotationally graze our bunnies. They have like a bunny tractor, I guess you could call it. But let me show you how we move them because I have not moved them today and I'm gonna go ahead and do that for them. We have this on here because we have an Angora and she has wool, not hair. Therefore she gets um, really, really hot. So we have this silver tarp that reflects the heat so that it, she can stay cool enough in the um, in the summer. Because if not, she could, that's the one like reason I rabbits will die is they get overheated. Or just any rabbits will get overheated very quickly. We live in the south, that is very common. So having a wool rabbit, we wanted to take some extra precaution for her. So we move our rabbits um, morning and night. This gives them not only something fresh to eat, but it gives them um, almost like fresh bedding. They don't have to, we don't have to constantly change their bedding, they don't have to walk on their poop and pee. We move them morning and night and they are super happy. They absolutely love it when we move them. girls but I will say moving them through our yard like this has given us some killer grass because we had people who lived here before us didn't do a great job with the grass and we had pretty much like I don't know some kind of weird weed that was growing and it was super super compacted um, but we actually we haven't aerated we haven't thatched we haven't reseeded anything but move these bunnies over that area and we have the grasses come back and been wonderful and I want really good growing grass because I like to make compost and grass is like my number one nitrogen hot green ingredient that I use in my compost. The sun has come out for a bit so that is wonderful. Let me show you something else I have very much neglected. These are this, our katsu strawberries because I feel like they've grown like katsu, but I fertilized them for runners, which might have been a mistake. So I didn't fertilize them to go to berries. I fertilized them with nitrogen so they would create runners, and that they did. What we're going to do, on the far side, we're going to do an entire row up to our house that's nothing but strawberries. And we're going to be able to fertilize it correctly with a good acidic soil and hopefully keep them these are ever bearing keep them producing through june or july but they have just crawled their way on over here so the strawberries had stopped here and they are now all the way into my walking onion area these are our asparagus so asparagus are actually ferns they will grow really big really tall um, a lot of people don't realize that asparagus, they, you're eating the shoot, the new shoot. And one crown will put up many shoots. So you can see this is actually one crown and it's put up one, two, three, four, five shoots. Um, this is actually purple. I'm not sure you can see down here, it's a little purple. It's a purple asparagus, but they are all green when they fern. Also, female asparagus get flowers and berries. And that is where asparagus seed comes from. You do not have to buy crowns. You most definitely can buy asparagus seed. And if you are good at seed starting and things like that, it's pretty much the same time frame. About two years until you can harvest. When you buy crowns, which are much more expensive, you plant them and they still, still tell you about two years until you can harvest. So you can get a lot more bang for your buck from some seeds. So 
we are going to, I'm nervous to move the asparagus again, so we're thinking we're going to take the strawberries out and move them, and then leave the asparagus, and then expand the rest of the asparagus down, because I have about 100 seeds I need to sow of asparagus. And this is my son, Zinnia. It keeps falling and then just growing. That's how zinnias do. They are amazing, and I keep leaving it because it didn't have powdery mildew until recently. It was pretty healthy. But like I said, I leave it for the pollinators. Same thing with the Thai basil, which, I mean, look at all that seed. It's going to be a weed problem. But, you know, what can you do? Here are walking onions coming up through the strawberries. They are doing their best. Here's more walking onions. We did a big harvest of walking onions, probably, oh, I say June or July. And these are all the tops that had fallen from them and then planted themselves. And in between them, I tried to plant some cilantro that did take, but I think all the cilantro that was that way, my strawberries smothered out. It's unfortunate. More basil that's gone to seed. Thyme, echinacea, which doesn't like being here. It's, I'm going to have to move it. Comfrey. I absolutely love comfrey. Its flowers are so beautiful. And I'm some chives at the comfrey smushing. Garlic chives sage we got our rosemary in the front this is the rosemary i started from seed she's getting pushed around by these big big herbs here she is i need to trim it back so she can get more light but real quick i want to talk to you about comfrey okay comfrey it's like super awesome i love talking about comfrey so yeah it's medicinal and yes there are warnings you should be careful when using it please look into that know what you're doing but let's talk about it for the garden so comfrey, you can take the leaves just like this, and you can see they are massive. Um, and you can use them just like this as a mulch. Oh my gosh, the caterpillar on it. It's okay. So you can use them as a mulch, especially if you have caterpillar or slug problems. They will um, come to the comfrey and they will not attack your plants. They will kind of eat the comfrey and kind of get stuck in them and lost in them because it's very fibery. You can see all the, the strings that are in the stem. Um, also though, comfrey is great. It has a huge tap root and the tap root goes so deep that it um, has different microbes and different, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mycelium. Nope, that's mushrooms. Mycorrhiza. Different mycorrhiza around the root system and it can access nutrients that are way far down. And we have clay soil, we have a lot of minerals, and that is what comfrey is really great at, is taking minerals and pulling them up because the root goes down so far and they have certain mycorrhiza around their root system that other plants just don't have. Now, the when you take the leaves and you mulch with them and those leaves will decay in your garden that is one way to put minerals into your garden another way is to take literally just the one the one comfrey leaf is all you need break it in pieces put it in a jar with some brown sugar this is a korean natural farming thing let it ferment in the sun for a couple days strain the leaves out and then that is a nice um fertilizer for whether you want to use it for seedlings or for your garden it's wonderful um, it does need to be diluted like one to five hundred so I mean you're taking like a teaspoon and a gallon of water you're taking very very little but what I like to do is because comfrey tends to take over it's kind of a bully I come through and just like chop the whole thing down and throw it when I'm making compost our regular, my regular compost um, and just throw it in there and as I'm making compost the minerals are in there and that's wonderful also um, I do also do the liquid fertilizer, which I really like, but we also put in ours um, cleavers, just because those are naturally here. If cleavers don't naturally grow where you live, probably wouldn't. They're just a really good source of nitrogen and minerals also. Cleavers also are great for people, a lot of medicinal qualities. But I love comfrey. Comfrey is wonderful. But I will say... Comfrey has uricating fibers, kind of like a zinnia or a cucumber. So sometimes some people, when they handle them, it bothers their hands. I have farmer gardener hands. My hands are rough. It does not bother me. Um, sometimes I will get them like on my upper arm, like up, up high by my elbow, and that will bother me because that skin's more tender. 
but other than that, so sometimes if you have them, like, I'm not wearing gloves, but maybe you want to wear gloves. Let's see if I can't show you the radishes I wanted to show you. There they are! They're starting to bulb. So I was worried with the high nitrogen that all these, um, all the broccoli and cauliflower need, that the radishes would not bulb. Too much nitrogen causes a lot of leafy greens, and it does not cause... Uh, bulbing. It will keep them from bulbing. We'll just get a bunch of really big heads. So, I'm not sure if it's just that they are using up the nitrogen and they're nice and close, but radishes are an awesome interplant because their root systems bother no one. So, they just, they just don't have a super big root system. They're just small. They're wonderful for interplanting. And they also grow really quickly. They germinate really quickly. I had spotty germination in here just because I didn't water. I just let it rain and some of them didn't quite germinate as I wished they would have. Now, broccoli, cauliflower, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, peas! So we have shelling peas, snap peas. Um, shelling peas are just like an English green pea. And then snow peas. I don't remember where I put what. I do have it written down, but I don't remember. They all look the same. But one thing, <gasps> look, oh no, look. That is a cabbage moth. Oh, my laying babies in there. I have to be careful. See, that's what happens when I weave it in and out and I pull it up to show everybody and then I don't put it back down because I'm too busy chitter chattering. Oh, stinker. I'll have to go through and get him out later when I'm done with this. Okay. So, peas, we have a bunch of them. I like my cata panels pretty high. You can see. And here's my cattle panel, here's the ground. That's that's pretty high. Like here's like my foot. So they're like my hip level. Um, I do that because for my tomatoes, and that's worked out well. I don't love it for peas though, because the peas get too floppy and they actually end up laying on the ground. I don't want them to, instead of being here. Because before they can reach the cattle panel, they're just they they're not they have they need support before then. Um so I should have done it a little lower. And cattle panels and tea posts is one of those things that's kind of a pain in the ass to move. Once, oh, excuse me, a pain in the patootie to move once you got it set up. But here, see if you can see, I did do like a tomato wire here for these guys. And then they came up. I just ran out and didn't get that last section done. So, but um, they're doing really good. And like I said, we had weed fabric over all of this and so there was a seed that didn't germinate because there was no light and it's a trombonzino squash it's from let's see if it can maybe it's a cucumber oh i thought it was a trombonzino squash it's another cucumber we'll see what it does that's a definitely a cucumber isn't it thought it was a squash but no what if it's the american pickling cucumber i grew a lot of space masters this summer which by the way super love them but um, they don't quite look like that, so I thought it was a squash. More peas. I had really bad germination here with some peas. Oh, look, we have a flower. Hooray. And then also, let's come all the way down here. We got more peas. I had a random bean. We had really bad luck with our beans this year because they just, they just kept getting sick. So I'm going to let this one go and see who doesn't like the cooler weather. More peas, broccoli, now these peas. You can see I was in here pruning not too terribly long ago. Okay, so these peas are a dwarf pea. So they're kind of like a determinate tomato or a space master cucumber. They're only supposed to get like that high, roughly, like six foot high. But what I want to see is they do have tendrils as if they want to like climb something. But as you can see, I have nothing here for them to climb. I can run a wire if need be. But I want to see if they can grow without a trellis. If they can, if they're, these little dwarf peas can just hold themselves up enough. And they kind of seem like they would. Now they're looking a little maybe like not. Because you can see they're starting to hold on to the netting. That's not ideal. So I don't know. They actually came in like a cover crop mix. They're an Oregon giant dwarf pea, which I know is funny. Giant dwarf. <laughs> My children love when something like that happens. But we'll see. That was kind of an experiment. Like I said, they're a cover crop pea. I might not even, 
I might let when they flower just go ahead and take them out. I might not even get um, peas from them because if you, when you have a cover crop, you take it out when it flowers to get the most nitrogen from the plant. Because if you let it go to pod, then the plant uses that nitrogen. These are not my onions. Then we have our lettuce. So this is the second time I planted lettuce. This is a Merlot. Oh, these are more peas. These are not dwarf peas. These are different ones. These are from our library, and it was just labeled peas. So I don't know what kind they are. Our library has a um, seed bank, but it's clearly run by somebody who maybe just doesn't 100% know that I don't know the garden or know that the variety matters <laughs> just said peas um, and here's more lettuce and like I said like that was the same one kind as in the front and they are now much smaller back here because these were so my later the Merlot lettuce these are from MI Gardener these are just his like salad mix this is not from him though this is a Merlot lettuce I know Baker Creek had it but I think I got it from Territorial Seeds pretty sure. And that's pretty much it. We have the same stuff in the front that I'm going to show you. Oh, look at that. Look, there he is. Time of caterpillars has not quite gone yet. Little stinker. So this is also lettuce from my gardener that has a little bit of the red hue on it. This is a mix this spinach that is now happy that it's cool because it, you can see it was sad and hurting. And that is our back garden. Not a lot of difference, but it's a lot to talk about still. Stock of flowering basil, the last of some bush beans. The chamomile's happier in the cool weather though. Have some on the other side that I've been harvesting. And then of course we have some dill that popped up because I had let me show you. My son had planted. I can't believe it grew. If you watch some of the summer garden tours, you'll see. He was a giant. It was the biggest dill plant we had. He planted it in this hole. And I was like, it's not going to grow. Sure, honey. Go ahead. Do what you want. It was the biggest one. Then it seeded all in my green stalk. But it happens. And here's more chamomile. And then this... I have been dying for it to go to seed. This is a basil. This is given to me by a friend. Um, this is a lettuce leaf basil, and I have been dying for it to go to seed so that I can save the seed and have lots of it next year. And it is definitely, and that is a big basil leaf, you know, compared to like these. And I can't wait to like put this on pizza. And then a friend, other friend gave me a holy basil, waiting for that seed. But this green stalk is going to be filled with more lettuce and spinach, which I have in soil blocks up on the porch. Now I'm going to go cover up all this netting, and then I'm going to take you up front and show you what we got going on there. we go let me show you an experiment I'm doing perennial cover crops let me explain <laughs> so this is some extra broccoli 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 cauliflower cauliflower so cover crops normally you sow them you terminate them you plant into that whether you're growing cover crops for organic matter to fix certain um, like nitrogen or certain amendments or if you're growing it for like a mulch so you don't have to buy mulch and worry about herbicides. Um, perennial cover crops though, but one thing about cover crops that like I feel doesn't get talked about enough is there's no such thing as a monoculture in nature. So cover crops because they are a mix is ideal for getting the microbial populations to your garden and to that area. So the microbes that are around broccoli are not the microbes that are around kale. And the ones that are around kale are not the ones that are around potatoes. And to have a diverse 
amount to have a diverse microbial population um, creates the most bioavailability of nutrients, the healthiest soil, the best ecosystem that you can steward to then have what you want, which is food. So my whole, that's cover crops, perennial cover crops. This is unfortunately just our grass, which is like annual rye, clo white clover, plantain, um, probably some Kentucky blue. What we did was we took a drill auger, and not a drill auger that goes on like a hand drill, like a gas drill auger, like the, the bit is like five inches wide. So let me show you how big the hole was like this big. I mean, it's, it, was, it was a big hole. And then we took sopping wet compost, threw it in there, threw the plant in there, covered it up. A lot of times, perennial cover crop, meaning you're wanting the microbial population to be diverse right around here, and you're wanting to keep, I guess you could say weeds, a lot of times this could be considered weeds, but you're wanting to keep that microbial population and you're wanting to keep the soil being fed by plants. Because when the soil is fed by plants, you have more microbes. If you just have like wood chip or bare soil, you don't have a microbial population. You are just kind of killing the soil little by little um, and nothing is feeding it. If nothing is feeding the soil, the soil is feeding on itself. So to keep the soil from feeding on itself and to keep it more microbially diverse, um, we did this. So a lot of times, especially in the summer, I've seen people try it with like squash and things like that, but squash is a heavy feeder. Don't get me wrong. Broccoli is also a heavy feeder, but um, in the summer, you have a lot of competition for nutrients and water where in the winter, the competition for water is less because it's just not as hot so the water is just not being evaporated as quickly and the grass seems to be holding the water closer to these these do not seem to be as lacking in water as stuff in the garden that clearly needs to be watered because it doesn't have this nice root mat here holding in the dew every morning like I said, we are pretty humid in fall, and we do have a high dew point, so we do have a lot of dew in the morning. However, it, ha it hadn't rained until, like, you know, today for, like, I think it was, like, two or three weeks. So I did have to water the garden. But here, I did not have to water. I am using and treating these as I do in the garden. So if I compost tea or if I use fish emulsion, I do the same thing here. So, so far, I don't see any problem with growing this way with the perennial. Now these were planted a good almost month after the garden, so keep that in mind. These are way, way younger. But I don't see competition for water. So far I haven't seen competition for nutrients, um, but we'll see. And what also you have to realize is this is going to go dormant. Um, the clover won't, but the rest of this grass will go dormant for my winter. And my winter kind of starts more like December to starts breaking in March like my, my really dormant time doesn't start till then it's just kind of where I live and how that works so it's interesting we'll see how it goes I'll let you know so far the plants seem okay and happy um, and this would be I mean this is way easy rather than having to you know start a whole garden if you just you know drill auger it into the grass it's a way to plant something quick so if you've watched any of our garden tours in the past, this is the front of our yard. We have these boxes around all of our trees that I plant into them. And I've gone through the, how I've amended them. They've been amended the same for fall, but they were originally established with different things like horse manure and stuff. So broccoli is doing well. It definitely appreciates the shade. Um, chili peppers are still in. They're still doing okay. My husband really, really, really wants to take this chili pepper and overwinter it, but this one is just so massive. I don't know, we're probably still going to do it. Um, more broccoli. Snapdragons that came back. Something hard. They love the cool weather. So is the parsley. Parsley is looking grand in the cool weather. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but parsley and cilantro grow best in the cold. They grow best in very, very cool weather. Same thing with fennel. Fennel grows best in cool weather. So just, it's kind of nice to have fresh herbs in the winter. Feels kind of like cheating. No, this is not calendula. This is zinnia, it's an orange zinnia. 
but I kept it because it's fall and orange is fantastic. We will have, I'm sorry, over here is our raspberries. They are still making raspberries somehow. We've been getting a good handful every, every time we kind of notice. The kids have been checking a lot more than I have. But we are hoping to propagate some more raspberries and take it on down that way. Let's see how much we can get. And this is a story of an apple tree that I will probably have to tell in another video. This is down our front rock. We got a lot of calendula and violas. You see the calendula is blooming. These, this are actually impatience. They're an annual, they will die in the frost. They were like $3 at the garden store when we had to go get more soil. And my very impatient children just had to have them and I thought it was ironic so we bought them. My son got a purple one and my daughter got like a white rose looking one. The cabbages and the broccoli are doing okay here. And that's chamomile right here. More snapdragons in the back. The snapdragons and chamomile are actually doing better than the cabbage and the broccoli. Um, I'm, I am treating this the same way as, as I am in the back, whether I fish emulsion or um, compost tea or whatever, but the soil here just isn't quite as big. And you can see these ones over here that have gotten more sun are much larger than the ones over here that are in the shade of this tree very much. So these ones over here in the shade did seem like they were doing better in the beginning, but then these ones in the sun have just taken off. But it's okay. The leaves will fall off that tree soon. There are my daughter's impatience. She loves roses. Does it look like a rose? I think it looks like a rose. They're pretty. That zinnia, I actually pulled it out and it came back. It's kind of funny. And then just more broccoli and cauliflower. We're going to, we planted, I think, close to 300. It was like 280 or 290 something broccoli and cauliflower. Um, and cabbage, like this, that's clearly a cabbage, but I have much more broccoli and cauliflower than I do cabbage. And then we have our boxes up here. I have mums and some things on the porch that just look pretty. Um, I will say, I'm trying to save my seed from this really nice variegated um, leaves, but I'm not really sure. I kind of just pulled all of this off and I put it in a baggie, dried, and we'll see if there's any seed in it. These radishes are doing well. They have not really started to bulb yet, but they're getting there. They actually have not been up that long. That's not my onion. There we go. Sorry. And then the dahlias have come back hard in the cold weather. Aren't they beautiful? My friend, Janelle, from North Carolina, they have a, there are flower farmers up there. They started these from seed. Typically when you do that, when you have dahlias, you'll buy like the tuber. They started them from seed. They're very, very talented. Aren't they gorgeous? And I have learned that if you have any problem with your dahlia, you better, better, better believe that it is a bug problem. The bugs just love dahlias. Like any problem I have had, it has been because of a pest. You know, snapdragons, celery, celery's biannual. It will flower next year and give me seeds snapdragons oh this is cool this is mustard from my kitchen like whole mustard seed and i planted it because i wanted more whole mustard seed for canning a lot of times it's used in pickles and relish and things like that if you've watched any of our videos or stories you'll see we make a lot of those things one of my kids puts relish on like everything um it's also in cowboy candy which i put on everything so I wanted to grow some more. It's kind of an experiment. If it does well, I will do a lot more of it. I have some here and I have some down the way. See the feverfew going big in the back. Feverfew is an awesome medicinal herb. We use it for headaches or any like spot pain. Like if like, my husband comes home and his back hurts or his shoulder hurts, it's awesome for spot pain. Um, yarrow, medicinal. This is actually the medicinal one, the white one. These are the colored ones that are just so pretty. There's a pink one, there's a red one. Actually, that's yellow and it has not bloomed yet. Oh, I know what I want to say about the fever few. The fever few, I think will perennialize where I am. We're like kind of zone 7B, 8-ish. So I think it'll actually be a perennial for me. But if it's not for you, keep in mind, 
it reseeds super, this is all seeds, super, super easily to the point where it can be obnoxious. Um, you know, I think I might take this one off because this one's just not doing anything. See, the one that's out of it isn't as smashed. I'm going to just go ahead and take this one off. I put it on something else. And here's another mustard. More broccoli and cauliflower. Doing good. This is a potato. I forgot I planted it. Oops. Our grapes are going dormant for the year. Broccoli cauliflower. We went through and planted. These ones are up. This is garlic. We planted along the front of the broccoli and cauliflower. Garlic going all the way down. More radishes popping up in between. I like to say I will come out here randomly and sow radishes and carrots just kind of willy-nilly. You can see these ones are doing okay. The ones that are really, really in the shade over here are not doing as well. But like I said, the leaves from this big tree, by the time winter comes, will all fall down. I'll be off and this will get a ton more sun, which kind of works out because it kind of secession sowed it without me having to really secession sow it. Um, and the leaves from the tree mulched everything really nicely for me, which was, you know, a plus. You can see they're doing okay, but they're definitely not. The ones in the sun seem to be doing a little bit better. You can see here, broccoli and stuff. And then we can see, I'll take you to each of our boxes, and then we'll be all done. It was pretty much the same stuff in those broccoli and cauliflower. A couple cabbages. Oh, we have some collard greens over here. Collard greens get eaten up by bugs really bad where we live. But I really, really love collard greens. And this is something that I have noticed is a problem too. This is a cabbage. But having it under the tree with these leaves on it, it's going to mess with the photosynthesis. I came out here the other day and it was covered in leaves. And I was like, oh no. But they're doing good. This is another, it's a Savoy cabbage, it's a collard, and I'm just kind of keeping them, trying to get the leaves off of them, but I do like the leaves mulch the bed for me. It's very nice. Oh no, this isn't a collard, this is another cabbage. Yeah, this one's a, is it a cabbage? No, it's a collard. That's a collard, a potato I forgot about. Y'all, I always forget if I plant the potatoes. Uh, more chili peppers because... You know, and they're just staying green. They are not turning red. The light, there's just not enough light. And here's something I'd love somebody to tell me about if they know. This is a stalk. It's a flower. And, and my friend Janelle gave them to me. And hers are doing the same thing. Like, just nothing, really. Like, are they biannual? Do they need cold weather? Do they need an actual frost to do something? I, I just, I'm not sure. They just, they're kind of fuzzy. And, like, I want to see them do something. But they just have done nothing. And my friend's actually moving. And her husband said, he goes, I'm digging them up and taking them with me. I gotta know if they do something. <laughs> but, we'll see. There's another cabbage. I'm trying to get the leaf. This one's really kind of shaded by this pepper. I really wish I could pick this pepper up a little more. But it's just not wanting to. And you can see this one gets the most sun, so it's the biggest. It's starting to head already. Yay! Get all the leaves off. And I will say, this is one of my better boxes. And then that one over there, it's my son's. And he just has the touch. And the first box I showed you, that was a pretty good one too. But this one has a hard time. I think because if you look, it's kind of on a slope, so I think the water just doesn't have good water retention. Um, that and my husband's hit it with the lawnmower a good couple times. But um, they're doing okay, especially now that they have colder weather. I kind of put this on here thinking they were hurting and stressed and something was going to come get them if they're stressed. Because healthy plants do not attract bugs. Stressed plants attract bugs. But, I mean, they're, they're growing. They're better than actually I thought they would. So these did not get any homemade compost. This is the neglected box. 
Um, it always gets planted late. It's the farthest from the hose. It's just kind of, I guess, just, it needs a little more love. But things are growing in it, so we'll see. I'll walk over to my son's box. His is definitely the best by far. You see his broccoli growing big. This is his, this is the best potato we have. And it's in here. His cabbage. His Thai basil is still looking good. More broccoli. He I'll show you his fennel forest. See all this fennel. He planted it because the if you watch one of our other I don't know if it was a garden tour, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, for July. We plant fennel for the, uh, I forget if it's black or blue, swallowtail caterpillar. They have the most beautiful, beautiful butterflies and the most beautiful caterpillars. And they come and they will only eat their host plant, which is fennel, parsley, or dill. I am done with dill by that time, and I am done with my parsley by that time. And we pl and actually they prefer the fennel very much over um any other one, any the parsley or dill. So we planted this and he planted so many for the caterpillars. And we actually let them each take one in. We watched them hatch. That was super special. I think it's in my stories on Instagram if you wanted to look at them. Um, but what I did not realize when I let him create this fennel forest is that fennel is perennial where I live and my sister-in-law has one that is literally as tall as a tree next to her chicken coop and I kind of said oh no so if it bulbs they his aren't gonna bulb but I have some other ones in other boxes that if they bulb I'm gonna go ahead and pull them um if they don't I guess I'll leave them but they can they can get like I said as tall as a tree and I kind of just don't want fennel trees and this is the problem box. Like, the one box is neglected, and this is the closest to the hose. It's been amended the most, and I just don't understand what's wrong with it. I'm wondering if the tree itself is giving it a problem, because if you look, there's a lot of lichen. This is called, like, Old Man's Beard, or Yunsi, or Unsi, or, uh, I've heard it called a lot of different names. It's really great in vitamin C, but it's a lichen which is uh, moss and fungus get together, lichens the baby. But when trees get lichen, normally they are dying. I don't know if it has something to do with it. It's a rutabaga, it's a radish, but things in here just don't grow at all. They just grow really, really sad. And I'm not sure exactly why. The best looking thing in here is this rutabaga and it's kind of growing. Um, the carrots came up, like things come up and stuff doesn't yellow, it doesn't, it just doesn't really grow well. Like the sweet potatoes have been in here forever and they are, like, for a sweet potato that is not very long. So I don't know. See, this is really sad squash. We had one tomato in here that got like all the way up to here. It was super tall, but it produced like four tomatoes. And you could say it's over nitrogen. You could, but... Things in here didn't necessarily get very leafy. They just kind of got like the peppers. Like this pepper was planted in spring when all my other peppers were planted. And it is super sad. Oh, look, it's trying to make one pepper. Super duper sad. So I'm not really sure. I'm actually thinking of taking everything out of this box and cover cropping it and seeing if that doesn't help. I'm not sure though. Having, um, trying to figure out what I want to do with it because it's just not going to do well in the fall for us if it's not doing well in the summer also. And it's been amended exactly the same as everything else. Thank you guys for hanging out with me in my garden today. I absolutely love the chitter chatter about all things plants, especially food. Um, put anything down in the comments that I missed that I didn't talk about. Put anything that you want to hear me talk about. All I kind of got right now is a lot of broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. <laughs> um, but if there is something you want to know, please ask. I love to talk about it. It really just like makes my day and fills my cup <laughs> when I, someone asks me a question about a plant. <laughs> so please don't hesitate. Um, we will see you guys next time. I will definitely get another garden tour out in a timely manner for November. Wait, what's all this? This is October. Yes, for November. <laughs> Thank you for being here with me today, and we'll see you next time.